Okay, um, first off, thank you to everybody for all the effort that you guys have put in to get us to where we are today. You guys know your guys' job is a thankless task. So I'm going to personally thank each and every person who's been busting their hump um, to, to pull off races. We know that's a hard job. Um, so let's jump in. Let's how many people know, know my handle? Okay, what, Diviner Greg. What does Diviner stand for? Uh, water finder. <laughs> <laughs> Diviner stands for divine, divine designer. D divine because I'm inspired by the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci's my hero. If I could be reincarnated, that's what I would be. And then designer. Anything to do with design, IT design, uh, uh, logo design, art design, landscape design, interior design, anything like that floats my boat. As well as course design. You got it, folks. Let's rock and roll. Or as we say, let's... There we go. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, participation. <laughs> okay. Um, no, we switched up. Uh, let's define a course. Okay, now, I've done a bazillion summits before. I used to run like 15 of these things a year. And the first thing we do in a presentation is we get you guys communicating back this way. What you tell me, because you guys all do course design. What's a good course design? Quickly. Give me, give me five things that make a good course design. Simple, smooth design. Smooth. Flowing. Flowing. Variety of elements. Variety. Easy to set up and tear down. Easy to set up and tear down. Those are good. <laughs> yeah. Look at look at my list. Look at the first one I put on there. Easy to set up and tear down. Yeah. Right? Because I, I I love designing courses. I don't mind tearing them down. I hate setting them up. A variety of skills. Hefty just talked about that. Nobody mentioned risk reward. And this is a big deal. And we're going to talk about how to do risk reward. And it's not easy. It's, it, and most people don't have enough of it. Um, throughput. How to design a course that keeps our numbers turning. Um, avoid the crash fest. Nobody mentioned that. What's our number one plague we have is the crash fest. Uh, anybody know the statistic of how many people actually finish a course? Take a guess. I, I know the number, by the way. I've tracked it. 20%. It's about 25 to 30% will finish a course. And I'll bet you the same thing will happen here today or this weekend. Because why? What? What? I mean, the only way to avoid that is put up two flags. Because even if you build big gates, people go faster. What was the percentage of people that finished the uh, Drone Nationals, the finals? How many people finished it? One. No. One. It was like two. <laughs> the finals. At DR1, how many people didn't crash in the finals? One. Luke Bannister. It doesn't matter if you build them big, small, people are still going to crash. So all you can do is do your best job is to, to uh, um, avoid that. Again, you want to design one course for both are for a variety of skill sets, novice and advanced. So we're going to show you how to do that. And then we're going to talk about flight ratio. Anybody know what flight ratio is? Okay, I didn't. Right. There's only one guy that's ever brought this up. And anybody know why Lam? Lam? Why he runs the podcast? Why yeah. know knows it. He brought it up. I did a podcast with him and he actually brought it up. I'm like, wow, you're the only other guy who's brought this up. Flight ratio. How many people here would like to see drone racing be big time? You need to know flight ratio. Uh, here's, I got these little extreme tips here. Um, if you're doing timed races, and James touched on that, there's lapped races, there's timed races, 25 seconds is your bogey. Okay, that's just a little tip that, that I've been using for timed races. Let's talk about flight ratio. A flight ratio is the amount of time it takes to stay airborne divided by the time it takes to set up that airborne race. If you divide that to those two, that's how much entertainment value you're putting on for a crowd. Okay, so let's look at RC cars for example. A typical RC car race is five, well let's back up. Let's look at a Formula One race. Two and a half minutes, I'm sorry, two and a, or about 90 minutes of racing and very little time, right? They're running one long continuous race. And RC cars were running around five minutes with about two and a half minutes turnover. That gives us a ratio of 2-0. An FPV if you're running a really bad event, now, so for example, a lot of events will run five lappers, they'll run 20 seconds. That's a minute and 30 seconds of flight time. And if they've got bad throughput, they're turning about five minutes between races. That's 0.3 ratio. Nobody wants to watch that crap. Nobody wants to watch a, a bore fest of watching people staging. Conversely, how many people here run three minute races? I do. He does. They don't, like they don't like it, but racers don't like three minute races. How many people here run two and a half minute races? Good, good. When this all started, everybody was doing two minutes, right? 
So moving to two and a half minutes helps you with your ratio. So this is what a typical event would be like. Two, and a half, two, uh, two minutes and 45 seconds if you're running a two minute and 30 second heats. 15 seconds to complete your last lap if you're doing timed events. Um, a two minute turnaround between cycles. Uh, 1 point, uh, 1.4 is your, your ratio. That's still, no one's going to do jumping jacks. No one's going to sign up in droves for that. So that number needs to change, and unfortunately with technology, we need bigger flight times and we need pilots to stop crashing. So easier said than done, but let's, let's at least make an attempt. Throughput, okay, here's your quiz time. When I used to run summits, they always hated going to my summits because I always quizzed them. Like, Greg, you're gonna give us a test. Yeah, that's right, you're here to walk away with knowledge. You're here to be, you know, I want you to walk away with something you can use when you go out to your field and talk to your event. Okay, so give me the four big, uh, the big, um, Throughput increasers. How do you increase throughput? I can, let me give the preface to this. I can take anybody who's never been to an MPV, FPV race, never ran one, and if they do these things, they will have a throughput of six races per hour. Yet all these big races can't seem to pull off um, even four or five races an hour. So what are they? You guys know them because you do them all the time. Number one. Small what? Small course is correct. Pablo, <laughs> give me another one. VTX, what about them? Know the channel you're on. Wait, more specifically. Know the channel you're supposed to be on and stay on that channel the rest of the day. Yes, thank you. Yes, for, for today's technology, yes. What else? They, exactly. So let's go through them. And, and dedicated chairs. How many people here have tried to run a race without chairs? It, it, if you got six or seven guys, it's okay, but as soon as you get the three heats, it's chaos, because I've tried. And I'm like, I'm going back. So yeah, dedicated chairs, put your spotters behind. For today's technology, until it becomes easier to change frequencies, minimize the frequency changes, um, and then go for a small course. And here's another bonus point. Keep your pads close to your pilot stations. Now you won't know this one until you do it wrong and you put your pilots over there and your pads over there. That's, that's 30 seconds extra walking and 30 seconds back. That's one minute. If you do 30 races in an event, that's 30 minutes you will never get back in your life. What about launch? Launch, launch pads. Launch pads versus the pilot seats. Well, pilot. One, of the, one of the concerns I have with that is the closer you get to your pilot station, if they're using whatever they're using, you have problems with the frequency of all the video. We keep already separating. 50 feet. What about the guy who flips over and is there blasting with people? Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, I hear you. Um, but the, the, what we'll get to, I'll show you a diagram of what I'm really trying to, I, th I think all of you do it. If here's my launch stands and here's my pilot seats, why don't I put them a little closer? I still need to maintain that because that's the flight line anyways. I still have to have 50 feet separation minimum, right? So all I'm saying is I've seen races where they've got their launch pads over here and they put their chairs all the way on the other end. And I'm like, why did you do that? Well, they just didn't know any better. That's all. It wasn't the, you know, and then the next event you're like, you know, I'm kind of the fan of, I don't give it like golfing. You don't give advice unless somebody asks. Hey, Greg, what do you think we could have did better? Well, the chairs should go over here, unless you have a reason for that. Safety would be the one reason for that. Okay, why do FPV tracks look like they're designed for cars? 99% of every video I ever watch is, I could drive this with a car. We, now, how many people have heard this from me? We live in a 3D world, we fly in a 3D world, but why don't we design tracks for a 3D world? Right? So, um, <laughs> what? what? It goes back to point one. Yeah, that, actually, that's very true, by the way. It's very true. Um, Every track I built this year has ramps in 3D. And I'm usually the guy who sets them up almost exclusively by myself. So I, there's ways to do it. Um, when we go and we ask this question, we want to ask why three times. My background, I came from a management consulting background, so I was taught by my mentors, when you're trying to find the source of a problem, you ask why three times. And you're gonna to get to the source of that. So one of the things, and I, and I, I looked at this, as I look at designs, I go, well, why did they do that? Or, or, or why did they make this turn so simple? And, and one of the reasons car courses are designed the way they are is because cars have to drive on asphalt. We fly drones. Where is our surface? Our surface is all around us. We don't have a low pressure zone going into turn one and a high pressure zone, right? 
the, the air pressure is the same. So we should be thinking slightly different than the way cars do it. You know, and the other thing that's really been challenging from a designing perspective is the thrust ratios that we have today are so dramatically different than where they were even 18 months ago. 18 months ago, we were flying at 3 to 1 thrust ratios. Now we're at 8, 9, 10, 11 to 1 thrust ratios, which completely changes the way you design courses. So let's jump in. So here's my litmus test. When I look at a, a design, I say, can an, uh, an FPV car drive this course? And I call those land lover courses. Or if I had a couple like uh, beers, I'll say land lubber courses. Says, so this is an important concept. Um, ask why you're doing what you're doing for every turn, for every feature. And then when you do that, you're going to go, oh, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Okay, well then make your life easier and get rid of it. And use that resource somewhere else. Okay, this next slide, that you, this next bullet point you're going to see may be Little, little bold statement here, the most important thing you'll walk away with, hopefully this weekend. And I will wait five seconds for the dramatic pause. Okay, I'll cut it down to three. Okay, I want you to change your way of thinking. When you guys think of course design, I want you to think in terms of skill clusters. We, remember, one of the things we want out of a good course design is variety. Right, so when we do variety, we say, what is it we're trying to test our pilots? And then when we do that, Let's make a cluster out of it. And let's assume the pilots are intelligent people. Let's assume they know how to, for their ability level, they know the best way to get from point A to point B. And let them get there. Don't say, I'm the track designer, damn it, and you're going to go this exact way in this much space. Why? We fly in a 3D world. Let them finish this skill set and get over there. And by the way, you might have some things in the, in the way. Maybe there's a tree in the way. Maybe there's something you can use to create an obstacle, but you don't have to build it. That would be cool. Think in terms of risk-reward, and what risk-reward does is it creates a way for different pilots of different abilities to attack the course. And I've only found about two or three ways to do this, quite honestly, um, and we'll talk about them. And then finally, think of a technical design. Um, I remember when we talked about the race format for the whole regional series, the purveying attitude was, I remember, was point, point blank asking, how long should time races be? And everybody said two minutes. And I'm like, no, no, we need to change. I'm like, Why does it need to be two minutes? My guys can't get through uh, a course. So I'm like, let me see your course. We'll get, what do you think it was? Put a gate, barn burn it straight through, barn burn it this way, and barn burn it back. Well, yeah. These guys are loading up on 2,600 KVs, throwing the massive amount of props and going as fast as they can. No technical issues at all. No slalom. Of course. So if you change that philosophy and make it a technical design, um, you're going to see things, um, people will be able to fly. And what's really neat, one of the questions was, I wanted making it flow, right? Didn't, didn't you say it? This is really cool. One of my guys, two, two of my top guys who are, who are going to be out there um, tomorrow, they actually went to me the last design, and I'll show you the design. They went, Greg, this is too flowing. <laughs> like, I thought this is what you guys want. No, we're basically, we're, it's two flowing. Give us some technical elements. We want some stop dead, turn around, and cut back sections. Okay, so let's go through um, elements of a course design and why you do what you do. Start, finish. We talked, James talked about this. I saw a design, and I won't say where it was from, but there was an experienced group. They put a slalom right before the start, finish. And I'm like, and then they say, hey, it's not, the timer's not reading really well. Oh, yeah. You know, um, the general rule of thumb is 50 feet um, in and out, keep it straight. Now, once again, if we all switch to RF-based solutions, you know, um, that game changes. We can put timing gates anywhere we want. We can put them in, cur in curves and everything. So for right now, until that switch happens, 50 feet in, 50 feet out, keep it level. It's really not that important if it points up or to the left or to the right, because no matter what you do, if they're rocking and rolling through the turn, you're going to get misreads. Keep your pads by the chairs, we talked about that, and then we're gonna do squeeze flags. Where did my dry erase go? What's a squeeze flag? Whoa. Check one, two. Let's take this off, because I can project, can I? Oh, sorry. Got it. Got it. Uh, a little story about one of these. I had these, I forgot to turn it off. I ended up going to the bathroom, and I was kind of what did uh, Scully say? Yeah, watch what you say. I'm thinking, oh, the mic's off. I'm in the bathroom. And you know, and I'm like, it's just being broadcasted. <laughs> so. Where's the audio on that one? Yeah. And it was, okay. 
So what's a squeeze flag? Most of the time when we design a track, we have flags on the inside, we go around the outside, right? Um, a squeeze flag is when you put a flag on the outside and you use it to contain. So one of the problems you have in a start finish, traditionally, is um, if they start coming in, they rock and they rock and they roll. Uh, one of my first events I did this year, I. I planned on a, like a 7 to or 8 to 1 thrust ratio, so I planned a, a line to come this way, the, the race line. So I put a flag over here. Man, these guys, got, they're good, and they're fast, and they got power. This is what they did. And at the last second, what happens? They rock and roll, which causes misreads. So now what I do is I push this flag out. Um, so they got to come around, but I got to make them square up. So I'll put another flag right here. So they have to basically contain and get straightened up before they come in called a squeeze flag. I see a lot more guys doing it too for a lot of other reasons than that, but squeeze flags are cool. Okay, um, and James and I talked about this on the phone. How many people here have ever done a staggered start? Okay, with a staggered start, if you do a true staggered start, you'll have a dedicated timer for each racer. So that's, that's a new term for a lot of people. I have my own clock, or is there one clock or many clocks? Well, we talked about doing a staggered start here, and we're like, we don't want to introduce new concepts to people who've never done that or never run races. That's as Shannon and I talked about that um, it, offline quite a bit. So I said, here's your pseudo um, start, uh, staggered start. If you take your flat, your gates, I'm sorry, your um, launch pads, and really spread them out, you won't have your collisions into turn one. And you're always watching your turn one collision fest. Okay? So this is a situation where we can do this, but we can still maintain the same clock. Um, okay. So there's your tip, tip. Okay, some more numbers. Does, how many people know what those numbers mean? Raise your hand. Shame on you. Shame on you. You, you, got, you, got, you guys got to know. Max, you know. Nick, you don't know this? Really? Okay. What is this? For those that are doing timed runs, we do a most laps concept. It's also called combined time. We just we we can run a laps format or a time format. Why do we choose to do timed format? Anybody know that one? I know I know Chris knows. Go ahead. Because uh, no timing run. That's one way. But we could do we could still accomplish that goal with with laps or time. The main reason we do it, and this goes back to last year early. Anybody have some slow flyers in your group? Like really slow flyers? Anybody have some really fast flyers? Do five laps with a slow person and a fast person in different heats. You know how long it takes? The slow guys are taking one minute to do a, a lap and the fast guys are taking 20 seconds. You want to kill the, uh, the mojo, the chi of your event? Let five laps with one minute each. Five minutes of the slow, and they don't crash because they're going so slow, they don't crash. So what you do is we go to a, a fixed time format. That means there's a race organizer. How many people read the regional finals document? Right? There's a section there that tells you it's all blocked out, right? saying this is how much time you should take and all this good stuff. The reason that's in there is because you can budget exactly how long each race is going to be. So getting back to the question, Greg, what do these numbers mean? Okay, these are the number, the lap times you need to get to get to the next number of laps. Right? So there's always those thresholds, right? Oh, I'm running a six lap, or what is it going to take to get seven laps? And this is, uh, these are the numbers. So how did I do this? Two minutes and 30 seconds is 150 seconds. Check. The first lap's usually slower by about four seconds, and I allow two seconds at the end for play. If we take 50 seconds minus six seconds equals 144 seconds. Divide that by the number of laps minus one, because you just need to cross. That gives you your times. So when we're racing, and this is a, this is a difference between fun racing and guys who are here to win. When I'm, when I'm spotting a guy, I'm standing, he's going to be out there. Even when there's not a timing system, I'm going plus three, minus two. And you're like, what do you think? That's how many tenths he is ahead of the pace or behind the pace for his target. You guys need to be doing that at your races. At one of our events, Shrug, you were there. Remember, I, I put, I dry erased this. I was trying to teach this concept. There was a dry erase board sitting in front of the pilot's chairs. And before I started the race, I go, guys, What's your number? Communicate that to your spotters. Pull out your phone. You know, time their laps. We're here to build racers. It's fun, but it's a lot more fun when you know what you're doing. Knowledge is power. Te create teachable moments as organizers. Okay, let's jump into actual type of turns. Um, these are three or four different things that you might have seen before. 
Um, I'm a big fan of more flags, less gates. People don't crash with flags. They crash with gates. So if I want to keep people flying more, I get as, rid of as many gates as possible and I create more flags to an extent, to an extent. One is the switchback. The switchback is basically a back door. Um, it's basically a gate without a, a top constraint and you come in from the back side. We have one of those. Uh, another variant of those is basically the hairpin. I use switchbacks almost exclusively at the end of turn one. It stops the crash fest and it slows the action up for the audience, right? And it creates really cool passing opportunities. And then you also can really see who's great jackrabbiting off the start. Um, hairpins, you guys know, the reason people don't do hairpins is because to do it right, you need a constraining wall here. And that takes a lot of uh, course resources. It takes four flags to do it right. But way you can implement this at your places, a lot of times you'll have a tree or something in the corner and you can't do anything with it because it's, it's tall grass or whatever. Use that as a, as a fictitious wall and, and stack it up right there. I, I've done this before. I don't have a photo of it, but it's really cool. This is an example of a sweeper that you could do with three flags. The problem is it takes three flags. But you'll see, if I look at almost everybody's course design, I can find two other flags that could be better used. So if I said, hey, Greg, you've got a turn, and you've got three flags to do, what will most people do? One, two, three, right? That's what you would do. I would say, get rid of this, put it on the outside as a squeeze flag, you now have a double apex turn. This is hard to do. I've done this. It's hard to do. When you're flying fast, what, and it creates risk reward. Why? Because here's what the slow guys will do. They'll square it off and they'll come around. The fast guys are going to try to go as fast as possible. And if you get it wrong, you just move this in a little bit. It's very easy to change. Okay, um, once again, we talked about switchbacks into turn one, avoid crash fast. Okay, gates. This is your easiest way to create risk reward. We've seen this. This is boring. Try to remove this from your repertoire. They go fast, go straight through a gate. Everybody way overshoots, turns around and comes back and does the next thing. I would say then the level of um, risk reward and, and opportunities for racers, back dorm. Swing around and come in from the back side. So what good racers do in the straight um, shots, if there's a, assuming we've got a turn, they're going to start yawing or rolling right through here. Right? That's what they're going to start making their change before they get through. Well, with the back, and then they can afford to way overshoot. The backdoor method means, well, they, they're going to start um, checking up a little bit earlier than, than sliding through. And of course, this is the best, one of the best ways is put your gates at an angle. In car racing, the, contrary to the a novice approach, as everybody, like if you guys have heard this in drone racing, they'll go, how fast, how high does it go? In car racing, they always say, how fast does it go? And almost all of the guys who've car raced before say, I really don't know. Because in a straightaway, that's where you relax. You hit the throttle, you check your gauges, you loosen up and you, t you catch your breath. What makes a fast racer in car racing is the guy who could carry the most amount of speed through a turn. The same applies in drone racing. Once again, we have air all around us. It's, it, you're gonna see, you haven't seen it yet in, in, um, in the sport, but we'll see it soon when people start to really um, evolve. How many people here, uh, I assume nobody, but has read Skip Barber's um, book on uh, racing, car racing. It's the Bible of racing. It's the scientific way to study each and every turn. And it goes through formulas and physics of threshold breaking and all these really cool things. Um, I tried to apply a lot of those concepts when I was doing some of my videos. Some of them work and to be honest, a lot of them don't work anymore. Um, but the, the takeaway here is you want to get racers rolling through turns. Okay? The more they can pull 90 through a turn, the better. Um, and then, of course, here's the favorite one, putting inline gates. And these are called flushes in ski racing. My background is I've ski raced before, I've done open wheel car racing before, and I've done um, sports car uh, racing before. So this is your best way. If you've got it, one of these guys on your course, here's a great way to create risk reward. Put it in line. Where do we have this in the regional finals course, by the way? Anybody know? The back slalom. That's an inline, that's an, it's not quite an inline, but it was designed to keep people low. Avoid crash fests with bigger gates. This is, I've got a grandstand issue this year. One of them is big gates, big gates. Big gates still allow fast people to go fast, but now you can make those big gates technical. So the slow guys have got to square up, 
and the fast guys will slice that big gate because if I come out at a big gate that's um, flush and I come out at a 15 degree angle, that's only two and a half feet wide. So my fast guys can still get their jollies off by ripping, but my slow guys you know, are going to have to set up a little bit wider to come in. Guys are going to crash a lot less. Let's take a look at um, an example of how some of these um, turns have been approached for the regional finals track, which we all know well. So remember, this is the Joel Brown method. Remember how he comes up and over that? And then here's, look at that method. The regional, the North Pacific people were doing that, remember? I was like, that's my track. That's right. <laughs> that really looks familiar. Actually, is this, no, this was, I don't think this is your track. This is, this is Zach Carlson from regional oh, okay. finals. Yeah, but the first time I saw that, that back was in your region. So see, this is a slow motion. See that? So that's that slalom. That's the gate in the back of the uh, regional finals. So some people were coming up and over, right? right? Well, why do they do that? Because they're more comfortable with it. You think it's faster? That's not faster. I'm going in a straight line and I'm coming to a complete stop. That can't be faster, right? But, but it worked in the other one where you, we had to turn around to go into the tower. That made sense because we had to do a 180 degree turnaround anyways and we're at 10 to 1 thrust ratios. That means we just push the button and it launches. <laughs> when you have those kind of thrust ratios, you've got to throw some of your conventional thinking away. And that was a big thing for me. I had a, I had a hard time with that. I'm like, wait a minute, I had to unlearn certain techniques. Okay, we talked about why do we not do ramps and flyovers. Um, in, in my, I ran, I'm going to be running six events this year, and every one of them had at least one ramp flyover. And most of the time I had two, and this last event I did, I had three of them. You're like, what? Well, guess what? 50% of my races are man-made and 50% of them are trees. And why do I like trees? Because I don't have to build anything. Easy to set up and tear down. Easy to set up and tear down, right? And it, 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 the, you got the hardest part about a tree course is finding an area you can fly in trees. And for the record, there's only been one tree course other than mine that I've been envious of. And he's sitting in this room. Turning mayhem. Oh. And did I jump on your comments and I went, this is what it's all about. And what did your racers say about that, by the way? They loved it. Did they love it better than gated courses? Yeah. What do you know? It took you a while to, to go from where you were, though, to that spot. How'd you find that spot? Uh, it's a family property. There you go. To find my tree course, it took me 30 visits of sites to find it. When I found it, I'm never leaving. I ain't leaving, folks. I can do everything I want, because I've been to 30 places. This is what I want to do. Here's um, a quick montage of ramps. Now, first of all, do you guys know what a ramp is? A ramp is we've got something, and we set something here, and we make them go over it. And by loading up that, that distance between where they, uh, the, the starting point is, be the, the trajectory will go higher and higher. And what's really cool is when you watch the videos back, you'll see the difference between racers and enthusiasts. And it's, it's so obvious. And they see it too, when they watch it, they want, I'm losing three seconds right there. We're like, yeah, it's not, it's not uh, joyriding. We're not just going up, oh, this is fun. They're like, you're watching, the racers are going, choo, 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 and they're around. And the joyriders are going, oh, this is just like those really cool videos that I see, oh. And you're like, 10 seconds go by, you do that for five laps, that's, that's another lap and a half. So here's some of our ramps that we did. This was the urban jungle one. Shoot, and then we come back around. Here's another view of it. This one should look familiar. Regional finals. This was a test in May to see if the tower would hold. So we have a ramp on the regional course. Notice we didn't build a 5x5 five five cube. This was the, um, that tree course was the first flyover ever done in an organized competition. So this is the place where we fly. The guys in Illinois know this area well. So that just had one ramp. Now we start dialing it up a little bit. Here we take a man-made gate and we strategically position it close to this tree grouping. Up. This person think he's losing a little bit of time there? Oh yeah. Come in, shoot underneath. So there was a way of using man-made and natural to create ramps. 
Okay, and then this last one coming up. Is this it right now? Yeah, this is the one where we have ascends. So here's an ascend to the right. What I learned this year, didn't know it last year, ascends, ascends to the right are far more harder than descends. I got the hard time seeing them. This was my favorite course all year. We had, we scaled the Sears Tower every lap, or every race. We went 1,500 vertical feet changes every single race. We basically took a 3D, a 2D world, and we flipped it up on its side. So we were doing this the entire race. And, there, and you'll get the size of those holes. Those holes are 100 plus feet rather than 25 square feet. So yeah, you still get crashes, but you know. This is doing loop. And then this is our, our championship course. Um, we have a reverse, um, a reverse ramp. So the point here is you can do it. You can find the way. Just do it. Um, what I learned, as I said, ascends to the right are harder than descends. You know, the old split S coming down. Coming up to the right is hard. Why is that? Heli guys should know this. I got a few heli guys. Hi, Jody. He sold me uh, a goblin at Urcha three years ago, for the record. Um, anybody know why right-hand turns are harder? Look at your hands. Look at, now actually do a right-hand turn with your, do with your yaw. Your, your, your left hand is going to start to yaw and push to the inside. Anytime you're pushing, you have less control than if you pull to the palms of your hands. So remember, if you're building an ascent, throw it to the right. And I thought it was just me. I watched the video of our good guys. They all struggle too. They all were kind of chipping and chopping. Okay, um, now we're going to talk about compounds. Uh, we know what a gate is, we know what a flag is, let's start putting them together. What's a compound? Well, a slalom is an example of a compound. Slaloms are very easy to set up and uh, surprisingly people aren't very good at slaloms. Your best racers are actually pretty bad at slaloms. If you watch the video, they're out eight feet over here and eight feet over here. And then of course the best way to, to handle it all is um, you bring in, um, throw a gate in the middle to keep them low. The good course design is if you're going to use your gates, you want to spread them you know, equally around the course so you keep people low, if that's what your objective is. Why do we do five turns? Because it takes five turns for people to start what's called tank slapping. They get behind the turn. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to do a quick little case study. Remember we talked about the regional finals. I just showed a video of that gate in the back and I showed how one guy, Zach, came up and over and then shot through. Right? I wanted to see what was faster. Right? And I saw the Pacific Northwest people were doing it. I think it was a couple of them did it. Um, where are you? Let's take a look. So up on here, the, this is the normal way to take it, which is the way it was designed. Here's the alternate way to do it, which is fly up and over and treat it as a split S. So this is the entrance to the slalom and the regional finals. Boom. You can see we're all leavened up on the video, right? So now the top one's going to stay the traditional line. The bottom one is coming up and over. And stop it. Who's through first? Top. Right, normal. Now, this is a random sample of one, right? So you don't have a huge statistical. But, but I think it stands to, to reason that if we're going from point A to point B, this would be faster than coming to a complete stop, turning around, right? And I say, well, I'm more comfortable doing this, therefore it's faster. Well, yeah, but get comfortable doing it the fast way. Right? Okay, we talked about compounds, we talked about compound flags, let's talk about compound gates. The carousel is an example of a compound gate. Okay? And you'll see um, the regional, or this CHAMP course has um, some compounds as well. All these resources, if you guys have seen my videos, they're all at FPV Tree Racers. I don't do videos on PID settings. You know why? Because that's technology and three months later that's worthless stuff. Course design, by and large, should have a very long shelf value. Okay, so most of my stuff is about designs and organizing and things of that nature. Okay, reuse. This is a really neat concept. We talked about one of the things we don't want to do is we want to keep our courses the easiest to set up and easiest to tear down. This is a concept called reuse. And what it is is you fly two different um, uh, flight paths and you reuse materials coming from two different parts of the course. I'm going to bet no one's done this, right? Because I, I, 
I've done it a few times. Nick, you've flown this, I think. We did this. This is uh, from um, Tinley. Okay, now the first thing, let me go through the course, and I'm going to solicit your feedback. Come through the start finish. Notice there's a 50 foot setup and a 50 foot um, uh, outshoot. We've got a nice 10 by 10 grid thing going up. I call the matrix. You go underneath it. I set up a flag. You go up and over 25 feet. Come around. Fly through this gate. I take two flags, turn them in. That's how I make my, I used to make my gates. Come back around under this matrix. And then we go and we shoot back through this slalom clump complex. Come back around and meet here and come back. What's the first thing you think of when you see this? Exactly. You're, well, you're going to say, there's going to be a collision here. And I challenge you. You give me a 25 foot square foot gate and you put two people like this on the same flight path. And I can't see this guy, Max, who took me out. <laughs> that guy, bareback mountain, boom, just, just drove right through me, man. You know, and it was not appreciated. And it was practice. Like, oh, well, it's practice. If it was race, I could sort of understand. Um, so he came through, and why? Because I can't see him. And it also happened at the regional finals course. A guy took me out from behind again, and I turned to my spotter, and I went, dude, we got to fix this community. Tell me if somebody's coming up on me, and I'm going to let them go by because finishing is more important than lap time, right? I mean, you got to finish. And I think at the regional finals level, you should be good enough to not take somebody out. I, I, I really believe that. So my point is, if I have two people coming in from two different flight paths, and I can see him coming. Don't you think the odds of me not crashing are pretty high? Because I can see him coming in. So you're at the gate. I'm, oh, no, no, you're using peripheral vision. You, you, are, you are. You're looking around. I mean, you're, you're doing a lot of things, but yeah. Uh, my point is, every time I have this, the first comment is, oh, man, they're going to take each other out. Meanwhile, I'm watching an existing race where guys are just taking people out all over the place. I'm like, no, you won't take each other's out. So the point of this is it's a great way to um, use minimal materials, and especially if you have a small area to set up in. That's the main reason I did that one. Okay, let's talk about trees. How many people here have made the progression over to trees? I know Pablo has. Corey has. We have like 12 dedicated courses, all, all the pilots named them. Yeah. Once you start going trees, it's hard to go back. Yeah, we have a separate course. Yeah, which, I mean, it's, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, I found trees. I went on the map quest. There you go. So here's the thing though. The first problem you guys will make when you design tree courses, you're going to design a tree, you're going to put gates in, and here's my litmus test. This is a course from a guy in central Wisconsin. And he goes, oh Greg, what do you think? I'm like, well now that you asked me, here's your rule of thumb. If I remove every tree, is your course exactly the same? Most of the time the answer is yes, because they basically build the same exact land lover course, there just happens to be trees somewhere along the way. So like, look at this case in point. Why did he put a flag here? You got two trees, if those two trees aren't here, this, this path is exactly the same. So the next event, he goes, do I have any volunteers to volu design a course? Yep, yep, I'm, I volunteer. Let's go and start using these natural assets. And it was, uh, and we got, we made big gates. We had less of them, and it was, it was a fun time. So, rule of thumb, it's not a tree course. If you take all the trees out, and your your flight line's exactly the same. Remember that. Okay, what can we do with trees? Well, the first thing you learn about trees is find evergreens, because you don't break quads in evergreens. Number one. Number two, if you can find trees that are together, you can find these peaks, these natural peaks between them. That's a risk reward opportunity. Your fast guys are going to slice that, and your slow guys are going to come up and high and up and over. It's, it's awesome. It's a great feeling, too, if you're, if you're slicing on the way down. And if you screw up, nothing gets broke because they're soft. Here's one that I love. This, this tree goes up 70 feet. I pruned it. <laughs> I got a little message from the lady. Greg, the groundskeepers have noticed the trees are getting pruned magically. You wouldn't happen to know anything about this. Who, me? No. No, of course I fessed up. Um, my point is, if I were to try to build this with a man-made course, there's no way I could have done this. This thing goes up 70 feet and comes out. And what happened was the good guys took all, I'm sorry, the bad guys went all the way around and the good guys came low and in. Perfect risk-reward ratio. Um, we talked about ramps and that thing. How tall should a, what's the tallest a tree should be in terms of going over? The answer is 20 feet. How do we get it out? Pipe. Pipe? What, what do we have? A flag. How tall are flags? 16 feet. How tall are you? 6 feet. Bingo. 
20 feet. 30 feet, it means you're going to be tying ropes onto water bottles and launching stuff up, and your race is going to come to a grinding halt. Um, okay, we, I'm, I'm going to skip this slide for time. We've already covered it. Okay, let's talk about the finals track. What worked and what didn't? You guys all know this track. This is a great exercise. Okay, um, if, oh, I got it. William and Zudo isn't here. But you guys should personally get on the internet and thank William and Zudo. Because this was designed in December, January, and it's kind of cold where I live. Um, but William gracefully went out and tested every permutation of this we ever had. I mean, he did it right away. And William's a damn good designer, by the way. So when he talks, I listen. He's like, oh, let's try this, let's try this. What about sponsor? Where are we going to put their logos? All that stuff was incorporated in this design. Um, and it was tested. So what are some of the rules? Do we have 50 feet coming in? Yes. Do we have 50 feet coming out? Yes. Well, this was a difficult decision on the hairpin because I knew it would take up four flags. The, the objective here was two groups got to get, two chapters got together and combined the resources. That was our constraints. Okay? So I was like, oh man, four flags. How many people here, what, what was the, did anybody crash into turn one? No. Did you? <laughs> there you go, one. Did, did, really? Yeah, we, really? we didn't have we didn't have anybody, did we? I keep hitting the inside flag. I'm in the wind direction. You want to know what one of our ace? Not this. We had a guy on the team, and I won't say his name, but he did very well at Drone Nationals. You know what his first comment was? Let's put a 25 foot square foot gate at an angle right there, which means nobody would have got through the entire turn one. I'm like, that's a good idea. No, no, we're not doing that. So once again, now I just told you, hey, put turns. At 45 degree angles, you know, that's a great risk reward, but not into turn one. No way. Turn one is, once again, the whole concept was spectators would be here and they could watch a lot of this close action right here. So what else? What about, a lot of people had thought this, this lower um, gate was the problem, was the hard turn. No? Okay. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't have any, not many people crashed there. That's a but, good course, man. That's like a great course. And then we came around. That what was really cool about here, remember I just did that double back and you guys says, oh, there's a collision. I never saw this coming. There was a collision point right there. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Guys coming up over the top and back down, we're in the same flight path. I didn't see it. Because I never conceived Joel Brown ever doing that. That was where the majority of them. Right, so you wait, collisions here in midair? Oh, yeah. in, yeah. that, in that section. In this section? Yeah. Right here. Crossover and the outside cancer. turn. In that one right there, right? For us, it was 7ABC was the killer for us. Yeah, for us it was 7C. We didn't have really any crashes there, did we? No. No. Um, but it was windy, so we were also checking a lot of our speed. So yeah, so, but I mean, w should this have been a back door? In other words, turn it another 90 degrees? Yeah, maybe. It's a back door. But what I, what I liked about it is it created risk-reward, so people who came up and over were slicing this at a very aggressive angle and then coming up and over. I crashed twice up here. Crazy. Um, William said, our guys in Florida said this is too easy. Uh, does anybody happen to agree with that? Does anybody think this track was too easy? That was the original feedback, it was too easy. So what was the fix? I made one fix. I don't know, because I said, I'll, I, said, I think I said, I go, I want their names now, so when I get all the numbers, I want to see how many laps they had, because everybody thinks it's too easy when you're, go, <laughs> you know. So what I did is I said, well, there's an easy way to make this hard. Let's move this right there. And we did it. And I'm like, I'm looking at the, and then what's nice about um, William is he does videos and he put it on there and I'd go, dude, this is too hard. That's a rapid descent. You know, especially if guys are, because then what your, your line is, you basically stage it up here and slice down. So I, at the last second I went, no, we're pushing it back. We've got to get people to finish races. Okay. So, okay, cool. Fast track. Okay, here's our assignment. You got your little tinfoil caps on, your thinking caps on. We're going to take these concepts and we're going to learn something. This is a track that those guys did that they stole from Andreas out in uh, Europe. Okay? <laughs> I mean, except you lifted his graphics. I, exactly. <laughs> There was no attempt to even disguise it. No, no, I, I credited him. I know you did. That's how I knew it. <laughs> His name was on the sheet. Okay, so let's look at this track and then you guys, let's come up with five ways to make this a better track. Using those objectives that we set up earlier. Put the multi-GP logo on it. <laughs> okay, we could do that. Um, okay, so where is our start? So our start is back up here. 
and we start here. Let's just I'll walk you through the flow. Shoot through here. This is kind of a sweeper, three gate sweeper. So we're now at three gates. This is kind of a double back, a double back. Here's your classic tunnel. Um, shoot through a 15 foot five by five tunnel. Hard right, hard left, float up, come around, gate, float up, and then back around to turn one. So let's start at the beginning. What's the first thing you would do? Well, first, where's your audience? I'm yeah. making an assumption that my pilots are sitting up here. Yeah. So then my audience is probably right there. Is that safe? They're going to be coming full bore, and they're going to overshoot, and they're going to be plowing into people. That's the first, I find, where am I going to get sued? That's the first question I start with. Right. So I go, okay, so how do I solve that problem? Hint, squeeze flag, hint, hint, hint. You're going to create a squeeze flag. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing we need to do is, if you look at it, this is way too close to the apex. We need to move this about here. I need a flag right there on the outside. I wish I was six inches taller. And then we could have them set up for the start fit. That's problem one. Problem two. What happens when you go? What do you not want to happen when you go through the start finish? You think they're going to be? I think good pilots are going to be rolling through that start. You betcha. So something needs to get fixed at the eggs of that. Agreed? Okay. Eh, this is fine. Right? I mean, it's a carousel. It's a high-speed carousel. Cool. This is fine. Nothing wrong with the flag. Maybe a flag here might be kind of cool. I'm sorry, a gate here. Right? Turn around, come around. Now this actually is important to set up right for the tunnel. How many people here have ever done tunnels before? Right, what's the one thing you can do wrong in a tunnel? Or, or, or had the track set up for you to come through at an angle. That's a great way to, to mess people up. Um, so yeah, if you do any sort of shenanigans here, you're gonna have a crash fest. Okay, what about this flag? Taking that out. Exactly, why? Why do I need that flag? This goes back to how much arrogance does a track designer to say, to, you must go this way. And, and the reason I bring up this is, um, there was another group in our area, it's about an hour south of me, and I don't know if they did it by accident, but they, create, they had a tunnel, and I hate figure eights, and I hate these setups, because all you end up doing is flying around, and turning around and flying again. I, I think I did a figure eight one time, and I said, I'm never doing it again. Um, instead, what they did is they came through, and they let you come turn around and come right back. So what you did is, if you were really good, you went zing. And if you were not so good, you went out, you set it up, and you came back. It was a risk-reward scenario. It was great. And by the way, they could throw that in the corner. So where were we at? Um, yeah, get rid of this flag. There's no benefit to it. The other thing is, this flag, yeah, maybe, maybe not. I mean, maybe why not just come up and come through that? This is too far of a distance. Would you guys agree? I got a ramp opportunity here, but this is not it. If I take this gate and push it here, I got a ramp. The problem is you can't do a ramp when a tunnel is five foot deep. There's no ramp. Because they can't, all of a sudden that ramp just got cut. So make your life easier. And this is one of the things that if you looked at what we did at regional finals course, we just went boop, straight up at the tower. And be done with it. Spend a hundred bucks worth of parts and you could build that in seconds if you have the right equipment. So again, quick setup, variety of skills, risk reward. Avoid the crash fest. Okay, so here's your takeaways. So when you leave this presentation, you should be thinking, think clusters. Say, my job is to test skills and let the pilot go from point A to point B. Remove anything that's not needed, because there's probably some waste, and redeploy those resources somewhere else. More flags, less gates, bigger gates. How many people here have done the big gate movement so far? We started with big gates and got flat for it, so we went to small gates. <laughs> Go big gates and make them technical. And now you... So we, have, we yeah. had over the numbers. And our may have been a little too big. We were 5 by 10 flat by 12. Oh, we're running 8 by 10s. And my, my, my start timing gate was 8 by 10. Yeah, 8 by 10, right. So go with everybody who's gone this direction likes it. Find trees, turn your gates at angles, and then always this... <laughs> Remember your events are training, they're, they're teaching moments, right? So, so, you know, hopefully when you go away, what do these numbers mean? 20.5, 24, and 29? Target lap times. Target lap times. Communicate that. If you got a microphone, you want to be communicating that. 
Um, okay, so this is an important concept. Everybody here talks about pilots, 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 pilots. And, and I'm running a championship coming up in about four weeks. My goal is 400 participants. You're going to say, you're going to, Greg, you're going to get 400 pilots. I didn't say I said I'm going to have 400 participants. How many people here are a parent? Have kids? Good amount. How many people here were a kid at one point in time? How many are kids right now? Remember when you're young and you're growing up and you're, uh, you have these little memories, that, um, I call them moments. And a lot of times if you're talking about it as an adult to your parents, they'll go to you, oh, that was, you actually remember that? Yeah, that was a really cool thing. So when we were at the last event, there was one moment. Do you remember what that moment was? There was one takeaway moment. Where were all the cameras taking? Oh, that kid, he had a... He had a, a remote filled with cardboard and was wearing his uh, Cyclops. And he was, was pretty crazy. He, he, was a, he was just a kid and, and I, we have a spare set of goggles. And I gave it to him and he just absolutely fell in love. He's like five, maybe. Mm -hmm. Somebody made a little fake transmitter with a stick. He was, so he wouldn't he was leave. Leaving, like, parents he were trying to get him to leave and he oh. wouldn't that leave. Oh, I was creepy. When I look and back at... He left and he came back, finally like crying, they like, made him take off. <laughs> So they, he, then he comes back with this little cardboard and stick and a little uh, tongue depressor thing <laughs> on it. And he sits down on it, and I wish I had the picture. But like, I was hamming up with him too. I was like, goggles down, thumbs up, you know? And I'd make him give me a thumbs up on it and stuff. And he was just absolutely loving it. But it was such a good picture. So, he's, so one of the photographers comes over and starts taking a picture of him. And then all the photographers that were there, there was like six guys just like, yeah, just take pictures. You gotta take a picture of those moments. Okay, now the point of this is you want to create moments and you want to have fun for participants. At events, how many people here get their people from the audience and have them step on the course and do something? I do. If I have an audience, I do. Mm. I'm playing FPV Survivor. They're, they're shaking cowbells. They're reading off fast. I've got sound effects on my machines. They're hitting them and they're, every time there's a crash, I got the kid hitting the button. I have, two, I have hundreds of participants at every one of my events. Because it, you guys want to think it's about, about the pilots, but if you have the attitude, you're pushing away people. You set up all the time setting up all the TVs, and you know what people do? I saw it. They go like this. That's nice. And then they, they don't spend any time looking at the TVs. I think I spent more time. So my point is, FPV doesn't mean you need to have a transmitter in your hand, by the way. It just means it's first-person view. Get people involved in your activities, especially kids. Kids are, and they're fun. They're fun. And the other rule is I always try to get Women are, are more participatory than men, so I always get the females involved. And then the cameras will start flashing, boys. Girls, ladies. Okay, that's it. Um, that's it. There you go. Good job, right? Thanks. Thanks.